Thank you so much, Kali, for being part of our Speaking Truth to Youth project for Americans Who Tell the Truth. I just have a few questions that I'm going to ask you. The first one is, what event or beliefs in your youth led you to become an activist? I know a lot of people have a foundational event, and I didn't. I never got the memo that when people try and decide whether to take action, um, when they see something unjust, that they go through this what I call the courage step. I, I just always was able to skip that step. And what I mean by that is that courage is when you do something in spite of the cost that it might have to you. I never calculated the cost. I just decided what the right thing to do was and then decided how to handle the cost after committing to doing the right thing. And I think that meant that I didn't have to be very brave because it was only after the fact that I had to manage the costs. Yeah, maybe one of my core beliefs is that when we make decisions about whether or not to be active, it's a hindrance to actually stop and think about the cost to ourselves because we ultimately end up making the same decision. Anyway, I guess I was inspired by people who've studied this a lot. Philippe Zimbardo wrote a book about the Stanford prison experiments, and then later went on to found something called the Heroes Project. What, what he found in his research was that people aren't cowardly because they are selfish or even because they're afraid. People don't step up because they're paralyzed by indecision. For me, re recognizing that, realizing that it's not a moral failure to not step up, it's actually a decision-making problem, made me realize how fluid and easy and well-facilitated my experiences have been with stepping up when the moment is right, in part because I didn't have to have that courage moment. And not everyone can afford that. And people have costs that are very different, of course. And, and also activism has been portrayed as an ideology. That is a misrepresentation of how things work. You know, just the other day I was driving and there was a bird, it's nesting season where I am. And there was a bird flying across the road at, at car level. And it I could tell it was going too slowly to make it. And so I braked kind of hard and I looked behind me to make sure I wasn't going to get in an accident. But I did. I like stopped the whole lane of traffic for that, you know, 30 second delay. And like, that's just as important as deciding to get arrested. I think most people are activists in the sense that they respond to the call of the moment. And then we're trained out of that. And we're taught to be unsure about whether this is the moment. And it, it is always the moment. And I think even more so, partly because we don't have as much access to intergenerational communication, but I was lucky to have that growing up. You know, I had a lot of people who are much younger than me and much older than me to spend time with and realizing mm, there are things I'm going to be able to do before I'm a legal adult that I can't do without extreme costs when I'm a legal adult. Um, there are things I can do with my body because I happened to be able-bodied in my 20s that I won't be able to do in my 40s. And so the moment is always right now. If I'm in a community of people and we know that our community needs X, I'm going to contribute the things that I have to offer. And those things are going to change over time. And so I better offer what I have now because the reality is we just lose pieces of ourselves and gain new pieces over time. And so if we don't take advantage of what we have to offer now, we're not going to be able to offer it later. Something new will come along and we'll have to, to take advantage of that contribution that we have to our communities. As you think now, what motivates you? What gives you courage? What guides you in your journey? I guess this speaks to the question of change over time because I was not when I was a bit younger, motivated by outrage um, or disgust or frustration, but now I am. I really like that. I've never really been motivated by hope. I feel like that's often kind of a, a toxic lure, right? The idea that we will eventually be successful is not my reason for being parts of campaigns. And, and now I'm starting to get angry because it keeps me energetic in ways that I might not be. Justice takes so long. 
Uh, and then when it does happen, it's so sudden, it's almost like an accident. <laughs> and so I think like endurance is something that I'm learning to build in myself as I'm starting to get older and understand that believing something is possible might not be enough for me. I might just need to be really angry. You know, all the things that I love have been under attack and a lot of the things that I love are gone. But just as often when I look at the story, I'm the bad guy. I am complicit in the attack. I am using this laptop right now that has coltan from a mine that I visited in Congo. I'm the problem too. I don't want to ever fall into the injury alibi, right? Just because we're injured by a system doesn't mean we aren't perpetrators of the system. And we are coerced into complicity. That's kind of how capitalism works. You end up working for institutions that do the very thing that's killing you. You end up using the chemical that's giving you cancer. You end up like buying the thing that's going to go into the, the toxic waste pit. For me, it's more the question of how to love less violently than we are doing right now. It's that moment of reckoning that you know if you're if you're living in the united states even if you are the most exploited person living in the united states are also a beneficiary of global empire and one that's collapsing there's this little bit of glee that i experience in feeling like ah now finally some of us are going to start getting to survive i don't know what the future is going to look like and and that's always scary but it's also really exciting a very large portion of the U.S. population came here because the U.S. was directly complicit or quite active in destroying their chances of living at home. Most people who came from Asia after World War II came as war refugees, essentially, or the fallout of militarization. Um, people from South America and Central America are dealing with the multi-generations fallout of, you know, the quote-unquote war on drugs and trade agreements that the U.S. has been really coercive and forging. Um, and also, I think a lot of people uh, forget their own history uh, about how they arrived, right? You know, for a lot of European Americans came to the United States um, after England's brutalization of, you know, Scotland and Ireland. Again, this is why I think like the injury alibi doesn't work, but remembering our historical injuries allows us to see how there's a continuity of violence that happens when an empire takes other people's land and money and people and lives. I am not particularly convinced by the claim that if we didn't spend money on wars, we could spend it on other things, but I am pretty clear on the idea that if we are divesting from the project of war, then our air will be cleaner, everybody's air will be cleaner, but also we'll live in a place that has more justice and that makes people happy. I don't want to have to make the capital claim that you will be richer as a person if you stop harming other people. Like, I don't really care if you're richer as a person, but I do care about living in a world where people are living fairly. Like that I want that. I was in junior high when 9-11 happened. You could sense that it was going to change the paradigm of how the United States used words like security or safety um, and how that was understood as the right to exploit other people. That's not new, but it, but it became mainstreamed in a way that's really scary to me. Uh, but I remember a time when I could greet my relatives at the gate of an airport. And that's that's not because of historical events. That's because there was an excuse to use more and more security. I remember leaving my shoes on at an airport. I remember not being racially profiled like by a, an institution in the way that, that I am now. And I also remember talking to Iraqis who are in their 60s and 70s. You know, they remember a time when they could travel all over the world. I don't have a date when everything was utopian. But it is nice to hear nuggets that mean that what we imagine is possible for living with other people in a just world has already been done. We can actually just remember what it's like to plant seeds or what it's like to grow a community or what it's like to live in intergenerational households. It's not perfect. I'm not going for purity. But it is nice to know that the possibilities are out there for just everybody being a little bit happier. So what advice do you have? And I usually say for youth activists, but I'm going to just say for young people. Skip the courage step. 
you know, avoid the injury alibi. I have this <laughs> list of things that I keep in my bathroom to remind myself. One is about making lives possible. Save your seeds, rescue spiders, like little, like the little tiny things that actually like make things possible. But it also means facilitating good deaths too. The other one is about redistributing wealth and risk. What do you have to offer your community and what do other people have to offer and how do we like distribute our incredible wealth of knowledge and our incredible capacities and like share some of the burdens and risks. One of the best examples that might be the freshest on young people's minds is um, during the height of BLM protests. There were conversations between white uh, allies and Black activists about who should get arrested, who should be on the front lines of police violence, because of course, white activists would be much less likely to actually die from police intervention than Black activists. That would be the kind of conversation that I'm talking about when I'm saying, what do we do about redistributing risk and harm and, and also wealth? I just listed a bunch of examples of ways that people are prevented from communing with each other. They're all around us is the material infrastructure that is often put out and, and paid for in the name of peacekeeping and security, but is actually killing and separating communities. You know, one example that I can think of is for people who are using airports, we are investing in all of this new wave technology. And a lot of people opt out of using it because they're afraid of cancer risk from exposure and other people opt out of it because they feel like it's a violation of their privacy. I opt out because I don't want to spend any money on it. I think it's ridiculous and I don't want my resources going there. And I, that's a material thing where it's you're at the airport and you say, I would like to opt out. You get punished through time. They make you wait. Um, they go through your stuff a little bit more. But what happens when you're doing that is you're in line. And this is why activism is just not an ideology. It's just a set of practices. When you're in line, people ask you why you're opting out. I get to talk to 20 or 30 people every time I fly. Boy, do they get me through quicker when I start talking because it's incredibly disruptive. <clears throat> the last thing is about time. I don't remember what sports coach said this thing, but it was something like be quick, but don't rush. There's something that's going on right now with time that is the, the main thing that unwinds us. So it's actually time regimes that are keeping us pretty occupied. And just thinking about what it means to not wait, but not rush and actually um, take swift action without it being from a place of, of panic or anxiety. And maybe that just means like, how do I want to spend the minutes of my life that are precious? On the one hand, life is really short. And on the other hand, gosh, it takes forever. What are you going to do with your time? Maybe that means like, what am I going to do with this decade? And then you decide another decade later, or maybe it means like, what am I going to do with this five minutes? Again, it's like, it's not a moral issue to never get to the important stuff. It's a practical decision-making thing that I think is really, we're getting crowded with stuff that's causing us harm. I mean, like it's causing the us that we're trying to build, whether it's in a classroom or a justice movement, it's destroying the we part and, and everybody knows it and nobody likes it. And so if we know that time is what's keeping our decision-making cloudy and keeping us from organizing together, then we know that's exactly where we need to leverage our power. I often now think about kids who have to walk through metal detectors to get to schools. What's that message that's being sent to our children that school isn't yeah. safe? One, when was school ever safe? We started destroying Native American languages the minute Europeans got to this continent. School is not safe. Uh, it's full of bullies. Most of them are teachers. Some of them are principals. And maybe if you are students, School is where you learn about power. Metal detectors send a terrible message to adults to remind them that school was never safe for brown people, queer people, any other kind of misfit. Um, so the fact that like the prom king also has to feel unsafe, I'm okay with that. What the metal detectors symbolize is that the burden of that danger remains on students rather than on the policymakers 
that those students did not get to elect. There we go right back to that intergenerational moment where we're seeing one generation having failed the next generation before they even get a chance to start. It's just a miserable feeling to have to go through checkpoints to get to school. That's not a good feeling. That's not feeling good is an important reason to fight for justice. That's a, that's a good enough reason. But I also think, um, Generations who didn't have to walk through metal detectors are also having to experience the wake up call of remembering and recognizing how dangerous school has always been for the people that always knew. What have we done and what have we left the next generation with? Who are we fighting for? And if it's intergenerational struggle, then like we got to fight faster, harder. Like it's time to go quick. Like maybe we also need to even rush because, you know, we've got an incredible youth activists who are essentially scolding the generations ahead of, uh, you know, uh, older than them saying, why didn't you clean up your act? We don't have clean air to breathe. You are choking us to death. We've got time to fight for the next generation so that instead of having to go backwards and fight fights, we already won, like the ability to have reproductive rights or the ability to have clean air. Um, these are fights that have been won and then de devalued over time because we got lazy. We are in a society where children get shot in school. That's on us, that's on me and, and you. Um, and so for, for youth activists, I would just say that like tapping into intergenerational wisdom includes learning from your elders and also holding your elders accountable to follow you because obviously they didn't do as good a job as you're gonna do or you wouldn't have to do it. That kind of um, security infrastructure just doubles down on the kind of violence that people who aren't safe in school experience. It doesn't get rid of the white supremacy that gets taught in the classroom. It actually doubles down on it. And it doesn't get rid of the, um, the homophobia that's on the playground. It actually doubles down on it. And the infrastructure that we can see allows us to understand the systems that are invisible. If I think a metal detector is symbolizing a lack of gun control, which it is, I might also be missing that it's symbolizing all of the things that were already in the school, separate from the guns, that make it so that some people feel supreme, that you feel that you are supremely better than everybody else. And that's that's always been there. And so I want to make sure that I see what I'm looking at materially as a very clear symbol of all of these systems that are actually really vulnerable to our organizing. In spite of me saying at the beginning that like, I don't really have any hope of, of winning any, any campaigns, I also do see this glimmer of possibility that it turns out that all of those systems that seemed overwhelmingly powerful, they just need like a little push. Thank you so much. Bye. Okay.